Everyone here is down the front? <laughs> I'm down the back. Everyone here hey. is at the back. Okay, so... Um, I guess we just go then, don't let's we? Let's just go. All right, then. Yeah, good morning, everybody. We are your support act for today. We are the first on. My name's Stuart Moots. I'm the director of the Shaw Pro Audio team in the UK. And to my left is Mr. Jack Drury. I work for him. <laughs> uh, and Jack looks after our market dev and artist relations for sure. We've also got out on the pitch, so please excuse our slightly damp appearance because we are outside on the pitch. <laughs> Not on the pitch, because that would be amazing. Um, we've got Stuart Stevens, who runs our product management, uh, is part of the product management team, and Pepe Malozzi, who some of you may already know. But without further ado, we are here to talk to you about the exciting world of Spectrum and to discuss whether your RF and your wireless audio is still legal given the year that we've just had. It is, it is exciting. We promise we'll make it exciting. <laughs> so we'll just uh, talk a little bit of history first. So this is a note that was a memo that was sent from Mr. Ben Bauer, who was one of our very, very sure, very important engineers. He was the man responsible for inventing the Unidyne, which is found in many of our microphones. Mm -hmm. uh, and then copied many times into stuff like this as times. well. It's yes. pretty much the same capsule design. Um, so obviously the SM58, which is ubiquitous for sure. But this was a note to um, Harry Knowles, who was the Shaw's patent officer back in 1947. And it was just discussing the fact that in 1947, Mr. Ben Bauer was considering how to get transmit wireless audio using our microphone capsules. Um, and even back then, um, we were talking about eliminating things like the amplifier. And there was a lot of concern even in there uh, with the FCC regulations. So even back in 1947, we were talking about how important and, and the requirement to license our, our wireless transmitters with um, whatever else was in that RF environment at the time. So fast forward a few years. In 1953, Shaw introduced the Shaw Vagabond system, which was our first wireless mic. Um, this ran in the two, uh, well, two megahertz uh, microphone, uh, had a battery light of 30 hours, which is uh, nothing short of incredible these days. And it was worked in a very much the same way that an induction loop worked, but this was quite obviously a big step forward for wireless transmission of audio. Previously, artists had been tethered to a, to a stand, and this allows you to move, albeit not very far, but allowed to move away from the stand, and then all of a sudden, production values started to increase. It, it was expensive. It was the mainstay of sort of, you know, the Las Vegas casinos. And this was the, the first advert. And I think in this, very, in this, if you can read that, um, no station license is needed. So again, even from back in 1953, we've been talking about having to license our wireless audio in that RS spectrum. And obviously, Shaw being a US company, this was dealing with the, F the FCC. And as we go on, we'll talk about what that means in the UK in terms of Ofcom and wireless regulations. So let's roll forward to today. So RF now is completely different. We need RF in pretty much everything that we try and do. Whenever there's a performance or a recording, normally there's a wireless microphone on our, or an IEM system. So we went from even 10 years ago to the biggest show that I think we ever worked on being, what was it, 80 wireless channels for I something think, yeah. in, in central London. Now it's fairly common that you'll find 200 channels of wireless on a big show. And it's quite important for spaces like this with engineers that are doing stuff out there in bags. If you rock up to an event like the Brit Awards, for example, or something where perhaps you're going to be getting Vox Pops you know, you're going to be capturing stuff for radio or stuff for TV backstage. You form part of that overall wireless infrastructure. So let's have a little look at what, you know, channel counts we can expect to see on certain things. So this is um, Britain's Got Talent. Obviously, I think this was over 150 channels of wireless. That all needs coordinating, planning, insurance to make sure that it's legal. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And then obviously, you've got all the camera stuff that happens backstage as well. So you need to make sure that you are playing nicely with the big RF engineer at the front. Otherwise, they're going to be very upset with you. What have we got next, Stuart? And then next, what have we got up there? Well, film production as well. Obviously, we see more wireless come into the, uh, into the film world. And obviously, bags. And obviously, this is a bit of a gratuitous shot. We're using Mr. Steven Spielberg there. Um, this was from, I believe, the West Side Story, the new book, which is out later on this year. In fact, at Christmas, that used a lot of shore kit on there. It was, and, and understanding RF film production is very important because as you travel the world with your camera bag, you Absolutely. might not have the correct wireless frequencies for the country that you're going into. So you That's need to make sure right. that where you're traveling, you're getting legal stuff. 
And again, these are just all examples of what contributes to that RF environment, that whole RF fog that's all out there. So we obviously we've got studio broadcast that works concurrently with side by side with like the location sound and all those boom operators. And again, field broadcast. But it's important to realize, I certainly know, that these that these people show and these reporters show that it's critical that that wireless stays on air. So you need to know what what is going on in that environment. I mean, I suspect there's not going to be too many wireless operators in that hurricane situation. I don't know. It might be us this afternoon out there. <laughs> it is pretty hairy out there, yeah. Um, please come and visit us. We are very lonely. But again, it all ties into that whole performance. It is... It's that, it's that show critical audio transmission that just can't fail. And this is what we're going to talk about in terms of what the, what the RF might mean to that and what could sink your ship. So this is an example. This was Emily Sande running um, our older Axiant system at the opening ceremony of the Olympics. And if anyone remembers that, it was a very emotional part. She was singing Abide With Me. Um, but at this point, obviously, this has been broadcast to, and in fact, that Olympics, the 2012 Olympics, had the biggest viewing audience of any Olympics, and still and still does. Um, the numbers were slightly down for Tokyo this year, which was surprising, given that most people be at home. But uh, as I say, this this was this was broadcast live. There was 93 million people watching. There was no room for failure on that single microphone. In fact, that microphone was actually transmitting on two discrete frequencies. So we're just we were transmitting the same audio on one microphone, but on two frequencies. So arguably, it was more reliable than having a single point of failure, such as a wired mic. And then moving on, given our location, because we are currently at Twickenham, um, we have sporting events. The, the audio now for sporting events is a huge part of that broadcast feed. You know, we see, we see more and more, we've got players mic'd up, the Premier League, although the broadcast um, audio isn't, isn't supplied to the public, it is recorded, it is captured. Um, this event um, with our friend there, Roger Lindsay, was actually down, done at Wembley, and this was for the NFL. But more, we're seeing that more and more across rugby, probably shouldn't say rugby league, and we're, given where we are, should I? Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, obviously the rugby league's packed up, the cricket as well now, so anyone who watched the 100, the audio is picked up on uh, every single point. And again, that is just adding to that huge, huge channel count, those huge channel counts of wireless that we see. But this is typically, I think, where we're known from. So, um, Jack, talk us a little bit about Actually, what happens. I think largely now this is the easy stuff when you've got big handheld transmitters on stage that are really easy to get to work in, in long distances. But even in this one picture on the left-hand side, if we just take the Bruce Springsteen picture there, he's going to have a handheld transmitter that you can see. He's got a guitar that will have a transmitter. There's a bass player in the back. They'll both have IEM packs as well. So just in that one picture with two people, you've probably got at least eight channels of wireless there, including spares. So it's not uncommon now for huge you know, and medium-sized tours to have hundreds of channels that need to work correctly together. And then as we move on, again, these are just, it's just the multiverse. It's just where we live in terms of all this RF. We've got award ceremonies. Arguably, should some of these people get in awards? I should leave that down to you to decide. Um, theatre, we've seen a huge, huge up, upsurge in the amount of wireless used in theatre over the past 10 years. And certainly, you know, there Without wireless, we couldn't be doing those productions. I mean, we've got Peter Pan there on the left-hand side. Without wireless, that production wouldn't run. Um, so it is, it is, you know, it's of primary importance that we've got a wire. You know, the wireless that we use is is always on air at any one point. And then we have got sales hat on a, a gratuitous shot of our uh, ADX1M micro pack being put into wigs. And again, it allows those production values just to go up. There's, you know, with with the technology where it is now. We can put transmitters into wigs, costumes, hide them in places they probably shouldn't be hidden. Um, and again, it just adds to that. So if production knows that you can do that, then all of a sudden they're going to be asking for more wireless. So this is where we're sort of at today. So we can see, obviously, we'll get on to the fact that we've lost a lot of spectrum over the past year. Well, the year that wasn't. Um, we actually lost a huge chunk of spectrum in the UK and across Europe. We lost access to the 700 megahertz uh, um, part of the spectrum. But com productions are growing in complexity. As I said, you know, you're not going to be asked for any less wireless the following year that you did the previous year. The wireless count goes up and up, and we're getting to a point where we're losing more spectrum. Which means there is an increased potential for interference. So interference can come from anywhere, from other users, from comms on site, from video links, from pretty much anywhere really these days. Everything's going wireless. 
But as as we saw in the in everything that we've seen there, there is there's, there's there's no tolerance for failure. Those things have to stay on air. If it's your job to provide the audio for that, it's your job to make sure it stays on air. So as a manufacturer, what we do need we we need to increase our spectral efficiency. We need to work out better ways of how to get more channels into into that space. And we've got to make it easy for you know for you guys and all the users to use. And here comes the science part. So I'm going to hand over to Mr. Jack Drury at this point. Well, RF systems are actually really easy. There's only two bits that you need to think about. You've got a transmitter, which takes audio and then kind of messes around with it and turns it into a format that can be pushed over the air. Um, the way that works between analog and digital systems is slightly different. And then we have a receiver. And that normally, I guess in our world, for, for RF systems will be where the stage is or where the camera person is. But with IM systems as well, it's all reverse, so the receiver is worn on the person and we're transmitting in the other direction. So we've actually got you know, information traveling both ways that we have to figure out. But in terms of what a radio system is, it's just a transmitter and a receiver, and the clever bit is how we get it across the air. So a little bit about how we actually do that. So radio waves are a perfect way to transmit audio. Um, we have two waves. We have our electrical and magnetic wave, which run perpendicular to each other. We travel at the speed of light. It's an ideal medium, obviously, to, to transmit a lot of data. We can travel through a vacuum. We don't need, obviously, air to, to move the sound. Um, and it's minimal power. It's a very small amount of power that we need to shift all that audio and all that data. And it's the same for video links as well. Um, and polarization is, is um, in the direction of the electric field, which also talks about antenna placement. So if you've got your body pack, on a person and the antenna is pointing upwards, ensure it's pointing upwards, or a slightly better trick, ensure it's pointing downwards, get those body packs on upside down. So in situations today, when it's outside and it's raining, that water drips off the cable and runs down the antenna and doesn't run into the pack. So top tip there. Um, but what is the wavelength? Well, the wavelength is, well, it's exactly you know for audio as it is for RF. Um, a wavelength is, is one full cycle. Uh, the amplitude is the signal strength, so as we're moving forward and backward, and the frequency, we run in megahertz, is the number of cycles per second. And then if we jump onto the next slide, Jack, we can see why, why this is important. So we've got um, three examples of where typically RF has operated um, throughout history in, 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 the, in the spectrum. So we have the VHF band down at the bottom end, and those wavelengths at the lower frequencies are larger wavelengths. So we can use very little power to transmit a very, very long way. However, there is a trade-off. Those, that the amount of channels that we can put into a space is limited. Then we have the sweet spot. This is where everybody wants to sit. This is where your 4G, your 3G, your mobile phone companies 5G. want to get hold of Spectrum. And they want to get hold of Spectrum because we can use a very, very small amount of power to transmit a lot of data to a lot of people, very much in the same way that we do. And then moving up the bandwidth, so in the very small bandwidth, up at the Wi-Fi end, the 2.4 and the 5 gig range, again, very, very useful for um, environments like this where we can use yeah, we can use the environment to bounce those signals around. But as we move up the spectrum, we have to use more power to transmit because that wavelength is smaller. And also, we're in consumer world there as well, so we share that spectrum with a lot of public, uh, public devices. So what is incredible about radio spectrum is that it is kind of treated as a resource by many of the governments throughout the world. So you have a fixed amount of it, and every now and again, everybody gets together to figure out how it's divvied up. So every service that you've ever had that involves something wireless, be it a mobile phone or a radio telescope or you know, lots of military applications, obviously aviation applications, it all gets figured out as to what, it li what lives where, how it's licensed, what kind of powers things are licensed for, what different uses things are licensed for, obviously. And we try and kind of fix that across the globe. There are a lot of global bands, but once you get into the regions, it does change as well. So this is pretty much everything that we have access to that you could put data in. And the bit where we live is this tiny little bit here. So we're putting all of our wireless infrastructure and mobile phones and DTV as well into that little bit of blue that you can see 
over there. And what that looks like in a slightly better format is this. So we've got low channels at the bottom here and high channels at the top. If you've done wireless yourself for uh, anything, you will understand kind of what this is. We start at TV channel 21. And we share, as I said earlier, this space with two users. So we are classed as program making and special events users or performance and special events users. Um, and we can put wireless microphones or IMs into these spaces. We also have what's represented by the purple blobs here, um, DTV. So this is literally digital television antennas sending Bargain Hunt and Dave and UK TV into your front room. And then the red stuff that you see at the bottom there is 4G mobile phone services. So answering the question that we're trying to get to today, is my wireless legal? They are the three things that we have to consider when we want to license a wireless microphone. What other wireless users are there? What DTV is there? And where is the 4G mobile phone services? And how far away from it do I need to be? Yeah. And as Jack was saying, so on this, this is pre, so this is pre 20, I'm lost with years now, 2019. 2020. Thank you. Yeah, so this was 2019. So May of last year, we lost access to the 700 megahertz band, which if you look on that graph is from pretty much channel 50. In fact, channel 49 is where it starts. And then obviously runs all the way up to channel 61. So the red band in channel 61 is everything that we lost as program making special events wireless users in 2012. So let's roll back a little bit, back to the Olympics, back to 2012, when times were simpler. Um, we lost access to that. So it was decided that after the Olympics, that, that chunk of spectrum there, so from 61 to 69, would be all turned off and given over to the mobile phone companies. And last year, we entered into a situation where we hit that again. So as Jack said, those TV bands, those TV bands, by the way, are all made up of eight megahertz chunks. That just is traditionally what's come from old analog TV. So um, again, prior to 2012, so channel 22, 23 in London may well have been BBC One, BBC Two. With DTV, we now stack those channels on top of each other. So again, as I said, just uh, for fear of repetition, this is, this is where we lived before May of um, last year. So roll forwards, and this is the situation we find ourselves in now. So we can see from channel 49 all the way up to channel 69, we've lost pretty much half of the spectrum that we were given. And given that, as I said before, um, you're not going to get asked for any more, any less wireless than you did the previous year, it does start to become a little bit of a struggle. So this is the first important bit of information in the is my wireless legal question. If your wireless was ever above 694 megahertz as of May last year, it is now illegal to operate in the UK. That's true. And also with venues coming back, with venues being closed, well, with everything being closed, um, if you're coming back in to turn your wireless back on, and at some point you find that oh, it's noisy, all those RF meters on your front of your wireless racks are all sort of bouncing now and being lit up without any transmitters on. The chances are it's because something now is occupying that space. Um, I guess one of the interesting things that happened in 2012 was there was still access to that space, use that, that space in the 800 from the TV channel 61 and upwards. That space wasn't ready, 4G wasn't ready to be turned on back then. But May of this year, you, as obviously as we all know, we've all seen the adverts, 5G is ready to go. It's already been rolled out. So that space is already being occupied. And, and if you're interested to see what that like, it, that, you can come over to our stand on the pitch and, and have a look and we can show you in real time what that, what that actually looks like. So as Jack said, where, um, are we still legal if we're operating that? And the answer is no. We will have to retune uh, our devices, and in some cases, unfortunately, have to upgrade or move to different systems in order to stay legal. But if we look on there, on a slightly different shade of green, in channel 38, that is our shared license. So in the UK, we have access to something that's called a share license. So any of those little green, the, the lighter green shaded, so 38 and 65, we have access to with, with something that's called a shared license but we also have access to anything else that's green. Anything else that's not being occupied by the DTV, we can license our um, wireless in, so any of our channel accounts. That changes as you move around the country. So what does that actually look like in real world scenario? So this was, well, this is the wireless spectrum up in Media City, so we were at the Kit Plus show in July, and we were outside again, and it rained in Manchester in July. But we'll, we'll move on from that. Um, 
So this was the prior to um, May of last year. This is how many DTV channels we had. We had 18 DTV channels we could license our channels in. So if we were putting on an event at Old Trafford, that being up at Media City and being a Man U fan, um, we could operate. There was plenty of space to put you know, a good show on at Old Trafford, plus still have all the wireless running at Media City, plus any other events that were running up there. Um, roll forward 12 months and post May of last year, we have now access to only eight DTV channels. So you can see we've almost lost, well, we've lost more than half of the spectrum that we had to operate. So again, those big shows, anything that was going on at Media City would likely, likely have to be retuned. I suspect they were already mitigated against this and probably preempted what happened. Um, and there's some very good uh, so re resources that you can see to check how things have changed. So again, this was, this was Media City and a little bit closer to home. That's what it actually looked like. So you can see at the bottom end. So when we run a scan, when you want to see what the RF actually looks like, those big green blocks that are peeking up above the floor, that's our DTV on the left-hand side. And as you move it across to the right, that, those two and three big spikes up there, that's all our mobile mobile data. So this was taken from, I think that's actually Media City. Um, but as you can see, we've got gaps in between those exclusion zones, that DTV, where we can place a lot of wireless, uh, a lot of wireless channels. So you can see we're in a position where um, the wireless spectrum and congestion and all that interference and all that DTV and all that movement that's been pushed us up higher up into the spectrum has put pressure on us and everybody else. And again, it's not just, it's not just audio I'm talking about here, but we've got to develop new technology to, to continue to be able to provide the, the kit and resources which we need to, to, to work under these environments. I'm gonna ask my clicker, manual clicker to go again. So, um, which has been fortunate because we are in a position where the technology's grown, we've, we've, we've adapted technology that we've been developing over a number of years, and we can now get to a point where we can w run much, much higher channel counts in a reduced spectrum. And we do that exactly as the mobile phone companies did by going digital. Um, but again, these are some of the resources that I was speaking of before. If you want to stay up to date on any of this, and I, I, and I wholeheartedly recommend that you do if you are a wireless operator of any discipline, um, Ofcom is the UK regulator. You can go onto there, create a free account. You can dial in your postcode and location and see what wireless is being operated. And it's important to note that these things change on a weekly basis. You can have events that are being put on on a weekly basis, which adds to the RF noise floor, that adds to those frequency counts. Berg is the British Entertainment Industry Radio Group that was formed by the users of the industry, so ourselves, Sennheiser, a lot of production companies are part of that, and that was the body that actually lobbied the government when we were selling Spectrum off in 2012 to say, whoa, hold on a minute, um, you can't just sell off the Spectrum, we've got, we've got millions of users operating in that space, and they are very vocal, and they, they in fact protected us and got us the, um, the, uh, the payouts, the actual payouts from, from the 2012 sell-off. Sell -off. Uh, Comreg, down at the bottom, that is the Commission for Ireland. Uh, and APWPT, which rolls off the, off the tongue, um, is European-based. There's a very, very useful document on there. If you are traveling around Europe and you are a wireless user, they will give you a lot of the frequencies for all the different countries. Because as, as we've said, this isn't unique to the UK. Across Europe, this whole landscape is changing. So you need to be aware of that. I shall let you do the next part, chat. So let's talk about some kit. What are we doing to try and make this better? As Stuart said, we're trying to fit more channels into a smaller space. That's something that every manufacturer is having a challenge with at the moment. Our solution to this was Axiom Digital. So one thing that you can do to make your life much, much easier is to take on a digital platform where you are constantly modulating that audio. So digital platforms don't have the problems that analog platforms do in terms of intermodulation or uh, the fact that as you get problems, as the noise floor increases, you'll start to get degraded audio. And this is the platform that we came out with in 2016. And it splits into two parts. The part that you see on the left-hand side here is AD series transmitters. So these are your basic handheld body pack plug-on transmitters. They just put zeros and ones in one direction very, very reliably. Um, and they have been used on many, many world tours, arena shows, stadium shows, theater shows, uh, all over the world very, um, with great success. And on the right-hand side, we have the ADX series of transmitters. And what ADX, the X in this stands for, is Showlink. 
And Showlink gives us the ability to take control of these transmitters remotely, which is incredibly useful, especially now in, in the pandemic times, where if you want to change a frequency or change some you know, information about that transmitter, something that it's trying to do, you don't have to go up to it to change that anymore. You can actually use a, a Zigbee link uh, to take control of that transmitter, and we can do that manually, or we can do that automatically as well. So if there is some kind of RF interference, we can swap out frequencies on the fly. So it's all about making the most of um, that spectrum that we have, the small spectrum that we have, to make sure the stuff that we put in there is reliable and we can get to those high channel counts. So do you want to talk about the receiver? Yeah, so we've had this technology around for a while. And again, the reason we had to go digital, and we had to, was the same reason that mobile phones did. We can fit a lot of data into a smaller, into a smaller space. With an analog system, um, the input, my voice, would be modulating that signal. And the deviation on that causes a lot of space to be used. It's not efficient, an efficient way of working. So we, we developed that technology for our rack mount receivers, which we've used in Torin and Theta for, well, a number of years now. And we've adapted that, folded it up, folded it in half, and created a portable receiver. But there are some huge advantages of going digital and why you know, digital is going to be the way forward for wireless users for the foreseeable future. Um, the portable receiver offers everything that the, that the rack um, does. We've got wide tuning, so we, can, we cover the whole um, spectrum frequency range now. So that whole bandwidth for the UK and for Europe and actually pretty much most of the world now, because we are being squeezed for Spectrum, it's one receiver to rule them all, and one transmitter as well. So you can take, pretty much take this transmitter and use it anywhere uh, globally. There are some slight caveats to that, and if you do want to find out any more information, please come and speak to us. Um, but the, again, other advantages of going audio, um, you get in what you put out. With an analog system, just inherently the way it works, with that, we're putting that audio um, carrier, onto, that audio wave onto a, a, a radio carrier, it picks up noise. With a digital system, as soon as I hit the microphone capsule and we hit the uh, analog to digital converter, we're dealing in ones and zeros. So it's very, very easy to strip that audio and build it back together to give you, as near as damn it, a good signal as a, as a wired cable. Um, and it allows us to do a lot of other things too, such as encryption. Encryption is a huge part of certainly our industry and, and what everyone here does. You know, with a, with a, again, older systems, you could just take a radio scanner and if you could happen to far come across any wireless uh, transmission, you could demodulate that and hear it. With a digital system, again, it's very easy to encode those ones and zeros into a system whereby only the, the receiver that you've got will pick up that. And, and again, more thing, we've got command and control in there, as Jack said, the full remote control, and it's scalable. If you're running a studio broadcast situation or, uh, and location sound at the same time, you know, the Big Brother scenario where they, they're going indoors and outdoors, this now runs across the whole platform. And that's the REC receiver. <laughs> so that's where our portable digital receiver came from. And these are our just standard transmitters, everything typically that I expect you've seen before. We have a handheld, we have a belt pack with an antenna. And I say that for a reason, it's a loaded statement. And we have our plug-on transmitters. But these offer exactly um, what every single short offering does. We have, you know, it's transparent sound. It sounds as good as a, as a wired mic. We've got ultra low latency, we've got encryption on there. And we've got some level of remote control. And you can run these on double A's or ideally rechargeables. However, this is where it starts to get interesting, and this is where I'm going to let Jack take the glory. <laughs> so as we said earlier, the X transmitters have that back channel. So we're using Zigbee. If you don't know what Zigbee is, it's very similar technology to how Amazon Alexas work and like Philips Hue lights and things of that nature. So we're in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum for the control, but we're not using traditional Wi-Fi channels. We're using channels surrounding the Wi-Fi channels, and we're using very, very small packets of data as well. So these transmitters actually have multiple antennas inside them. We've got a primary antenna for sending, obviously, the RF to our receiver, and then we have a transceiving antenna in each of these that does um, the, the control. And things that we can um, control with this, you know, we can, as we said earlier, we can, we can take control of the frequency automatically, we can take control of um, the RF power, we can RF mute as well, which is insanely helpful in RF applications for broadcast. Um, and the ADX transmitters have a few other tricks up their sleeve as well. So the form factors are a bit smaller, um, they're a bit neater, I guess. There's a few more options in terms of power, so they will, they will turn up to be um, 
to be more powerful transmitters as well. And then there are some specialized transmitters in this system as well. So the first one is the micro body pack, which was specifically designed for theater. Theater is a horrendous place to try and do any RF because I think it's probably, you know, you want to hide that pack as much as you can, and it's going to go through absolute hell as well. Like actors are jumping up and down, sweating, it's dusty, it's horrible, there's pain, there's, you know, people do horrendous things to the microphone. So this pack had to be insanely reliable, good quality, mm -hmm. comfortable. Um, yeah, the list of things that this had to hit was endless. And we released it, and it's done very, very well. So this you will find in the Harry Potter show, for example, both of the Mamma Mia's, um, all over the world in theatre. And now that we're making the moves into broadcast with our portable receiver, this is finding a very happy home in broadcast. We have some other transmitter options for body packs as well. Um, if you need to have a microphone pack that is waterproof, we have done this uh, collaboration with Q5X. And Q5X have been making waterproof versions of transmitters for a long time, but they've always been analog, kind of licensed versions of, of analog stuff. This is quite special because we've actually licensed to them the Axiom Digital module to put in these. So if you buy this, it talks to an Axiom Digital receiver, racked or, or wireless, um, in exactly the same way that any of our packs will. And that gives us a couple of extra things. So we've got the player mic, which is a flexible microphone, and the aqua mic, which can be submerged, I think, up to 30 meters, if, that's, if I've got that right. Um, and yeah, it works absolutely the same with all of the infrastructure, all the Axiom Digital infrastructure that we have. Anything that you want to add, Stuart? No, it, uh, this collaboration came about for exactly you know, some of the reasons we are talking about before. Those player mics, they're very flexible, they're designed to be worn on the body and hidden. Um, but it was just something that, that again, we, we're trying to offer the, an entire portfolio for broadcast and for any type of wireless. And, it just, and this just covers, and covers a few things that was, was missing from previously. So we'll just talk a little bit more about the advantages of going digital and, and, and why, why we need to move into that. Another feature of what Accent Digital allows, and unfortunately sales hat is going back on a little bit, we can run a lot more channels into a much smaller space. So again, this goes back to that, 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 that need to complex, you know, productions are getting way more complex. We're getting asked for more and more channels. And this, was a, this is a technique that Shaw developed in order to sort of combat that. So in a standard mode, we can run maybe 22, 23 channels into one of those TV bands, which is a high channel count as it stands anyway. Analog was typically anywhere between 8 and 10, 12, 12 if you on a good day. on a good day. But again, that spectrum's being squeezed. We're losing a lot of it. We needed to find a method of increasing that channel count. So the high density mode, um, there's a little bit of a trade-off. We reduce the power somewhat. And then we also, the, the latency increases somewhat. So it's not ideal for any scenario. But the advantage and the, and, the, and the ability to be able to go into this high density mode means that you will always, hopefully, be able to find space and spectrum for any of your wireless transmitters. Would I recommend putting 63 channels into a small space? Probably not. But again, if you needed to find that space, this option is there for you. And that kind of brings it to the end. I know we've got a run a little bit, good afternoon sir, we've uh, run a little bit um, quicker than normal, but if there are any questions, if anyone's got any questions, I believe. I don't know how we're going to hear any questions. No, neither do Anybody I. Anybody know semaphore ah, sign language? We have a gentleman with a, uh, a wireless microphone, is that? We should. Any not questions? Not one of our one? ones. Not to worry. Any questions at all? I've got a question, Jack. Have we seen any instances of where We've come back to work and we've seen exactly that. There, have there been any instances whereby people have had to retune their kit? There's been any, any shows or anything that, that have required you know, a retuning since, since May? Well, so not necessarily since May. I, I think we're still waiting for that because the uh, mobile phone companies are only really testing 5G at the moment. A few of them are kind of knocking on the door. But when we've been running scans kind of in, at shows and various places like this, for example, we're not seeing that 5G block noise yet in the way that I would have expected to by now, to be honest. But it's going to happen. And in 2012, when we lost um, the 4G spectrum, it was every week there was a phone call from somebody, yeah. in, normally in a church or a school or something of that nature, who've had a system integrated. So they've been sold a system that's been actually put in, and they've just left it on the same frequencies forever. And generally what happens is it's fine up until the point that the church fills up with people. 
and mobile phones are, are kind of doing two things. They're listening to information that's being sent by the base stations, but they're also pinging information back. And when it's a you know, small space, if you're at home, you're not going to notice that. But when it's a big space, like an arena or a stadium mm. as well, that spectrum becomes very, very congested and very, very busy. That's a good point. Um, it, it's also important to note that this isn't just a snapshot of something that happens you know, when a show's on. This landscape is moving constantly all the time. Mm. So today, as we are here, if there was, you know, given the small event on, you would see that noise floor rise. But, you know, on a match day down here, you would, that, that RF noise floor would slowly creep up and creep up and creep up. And, um, go on. So obviously, it's, it's, it's all well and good making sure that your system is up and running, but you need to be really monitoring that RF, that RF environment as you're going along and getting closer to showtime. Well, and speaking of that, we've spoken a lot about the tools we have to transmit and receive, but have we got any other tools that we can use to make our life easier? That's very true, yeah. Um, we also have a free uh, software called Wireless Workbench, which in conjunction with any Shore hardware, you can turn any Shore piece of hardware into a scanner, so you can physically see what that RF spectrum looks like at any one time. There's also a few other tools we have. We have a, a monitoring software tool called Wave Tool, which is ideal for broadcast, which also monitors the audio in there. And if you want to see any of this, we are, as I said, bring your umbrella. I hope it's not raining now, but we are pitch side with, uh, with all this kit. And it is, the, the, I think, the ancillary tools now that are the most important because the job of anybody recording sound or an RF engineer on a show is as much about the logistics of figuring this stuff out and labeling things and making it work well as it is doing the RF and, and getting the sound, I think, especially as shows get more and more complex. So yeah. having these tools available to make that process easier I think makes life a lot easier for other yeah, people. Absolutely. So one more, one more call out for any questions. I'm going to say no. In a minute, I'm going to ask these gentlemen who are running this what their wireless system is and if they're licensed. It's an AVX. I've seen it. It's what? Decked. Oh, it's decked. Mm. There we go. License free. Right. Should we get a coffee? I think so. I think we're all good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If you want to come and see us out there. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.